She was introduced to us on season four of RuPaul's Drag Race as the reality villain of the season. Once again, came back for All Stars 2 as the reality villain of the season and has since shown the world that maybe it was just the edit. Her compassion for charity is phenomenal and her beautiful cosplay looks have her going into mainstream media. Her name's Phoebe O'Hara and she's about to be exposed virtually. Thank you so much for being here. What that? That intro is amazing. I need that as like my bio. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, so That's how I thought I was going to be introduced on All Stars. <laughs> I thought you should have been introduced on All Stars. I, I agree with you. I should have hired you. <laughs> this episode of Exposed is sponsored by Manscaped.com. Well, Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below the waist grooming and hygiene. They created the world's first all-in-one manscaping kit that makes manscaping safe and easy. And let me tell you, it really does. I'm not nicking and knacking my no-no zone. The Lawnmower 3.0 Waterproof Body Trimmer is hands down my favorite electric trimmer. I think it's really hard to actually find something that works and does it well. And that's exactly what the Lawnmower does. It comes with all these great features. It has a very cool design, ceramic blades, and this advanced skin safe technology, which means you're not nicking and no snagging on your area. And it also has this really cool built-in LED light that illuminates your areas so you can see all the little nicks and knacks and get all in there. So the new and improved Perfect Package 3.0 kit includes the new Lawn Mower 3.0 Cordless Waterproof Manscaping Trimmer, plus a whole lot of different add-ons. Get 20% off plus free shipping from your Perfect Package 3.0 purchase when you use promo code SHEP20 at manscaped.com. Now let's get back to Exposed. Now, before we get into a deep dive of your life, one thing that I noticed that you've said um, previously on the internet and stuff is that you have a differentiation now between Fifi and Jeremy. So yeah. for this interview, how would you like for me to refer to you as? Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I like being called Jeremy 24-7. Um, okay. I, 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 Fifi is a character, kind of like, like, um, like Tyler Perry and Medea. Like, mm -hmm. you, you don't go around calling... You know, Tyler Perry, hey, Medea, what's, I mean, maybe some do, but for me, it's, it's a totally different, it's just a character, but um, yeah, I like to be called Jeremy, so you can call me Jeremy. All right, well, it'll be Jeremy from there. So, let's get started. You were born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. I was, yes. What was little Jeremy like in the Deep South? Uh, well, Jeremy had a girlfriend for many, many years. <laughs> um, I was a big, fat kid. I played a lot of video games. I liked comic books. I, yeah, I, I went to church, uh, a school in church. That's where I had my first kiss with a girl. <laughs> so yeah, it was quite different than uh, the life I live now. Yeah. Um, did, did anything in Texas inspire your drag? Um, I mean, growing, I've shared the story about growing up. Um, I, I grew up in a really abusive household. And so I would read these comic books to escape and kind of get lost in these characters to kind of like, to take me out of that like horrible world I was living in and like transport me into a world where being a freak, um, um, different, um, I gay, um, was accepted. And so I, I think I just wanted to transform myself into these superheroes so that way I could like cope with the surroundings. So when was the first time that you donned drag and you decided I'm gonna go out and you had your first performance? When was that, what age? That was in, I went to April or May when I was like, Eight, I just turned 18 years old. It was the first time I could go to like the club. Um, I, I remember watching these people do the amateur contest and it was like, it was, it was so boring. There was no like feeling or passion behind their number. And I was like, I could do that. And they were like, no, 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 you couldn't do that. Like this takes a lot of work, girl. You can't just walk up there and do it. I was like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I entered an amateur contest. I paid someone to do my makeup. Nobody knew it was me. And I don't know how because at the time I had a snaggle tooth <laughs> and uh, you couldn't miss it. So I don't know how they, they didn't. Um, but I won. I remember I won everything straight through. And then I finally got out of drag in front of everybody. And they were just like, what? And with that, your name wasn't Fifi originally, right? No, it was Phoenix from the X-Men, another comic book hero. So, there you yeah. go. What, what inspired you to take the name Phoenix and then what led from Phoenix to Fifi? Well, um, I took Phoenix because, so I feel like everybody, everybody can relate to Phoenix for the simple fact that Phoenix is, is the most powerful of all X-Men, you know, arguably the most powerful X-Men. And it, it, the way that she would become the most powerful is if she could harness her good and her bad. And I think everybody has a good and bad to them. 
And I think if they know how to find the happy medium and, and their strengths in there, they can be the most powerful being that they are. So I chose Phoenix for that reason. Um, I, I went through a lot, like I said, as a child. So I, and I kept rising up. I, I went from being abused to being homeless to stealing food. Like I, I've been through it all. So, but no matter what, I always, you know, rose from the ashes. So that's where I kept like Phoenix from. And then on, um, when I got the call to be on season four, there was a Phoenix in the past season, the prior season. And they asked if I went by any other nickname and um, Dita Ritz used to call me Phonix all the time, but I was not about to go on TV as Phonix. So it just wasn't gonna happen. And um, she called me like Fifi, like maybe once or twice, but I was like, oh yeah, Fifi. She calls me Fifi all the time. And it just, it just stuck. But I would have said anything to get on TV. <laughs> <laughs> now for season four, did you audition before season four? Uh, all I put in for season four was, the, um, they used to have like the, I don't know how, I don't know the audition process goes now, but they used to have like the paper audition, you know, application online. And um, I did that and they called me back and I never ever called them. I never replied because I was dating a guy at the time that did not want me to leave. He did not want me to be gone for X amount of days to film the show. So I was like, you know what? I didn't do it. And then um, season four came around and um, what was it? What was the other show? What was the one that Scott had asked? America's Got Talent. I forgot what show it was on. So many shows want me. Never <laughs> you know, um, at the same time as my season four audition, um, America's Got Talent was scouting me out to be on their show. So I had to pick like which one I wanted to do. And I went with Drag Race because Drag Race at the time just catered directly you know, to you know, this art. And so I was like, let me go somewhere where it's going to be respected and, and I could shine. So you get on Drag Race, you walk through the door. What is the first feeling that you have walking into that workroom? Well, I mean, there's cameras in your face the moment you walk right in. So it was, that was like the, you know there's cameras in there, but like it was the whole like, okay, shit, this is really happening. Oh, we are really filming a TV show now. Um, it's quite different now. <laughs> filming like all stars versus season four and how the you know the camera situation was but it was just like this is it like this is the time for the whole world to watch so let's have fun <laughs> did you have fun on season four i had a blast okay well, i had a blast because i knew i was a villain <laughs> i was like <laughs> villains are like my favorite characters like and, and when you're watching tvs and movies and everything they're, they're always the best so I knew I was bad and I was having fun with it. I did not realize how bad it would perceive on TV. And if that was the case, no, I wouldn't have changed it. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were recently on Willem and Alaska's podcast, Race Chaser. I was. And you yes. said that the um, villain and the tension that you had with Sharon was all kind of amped up. Yeah. Um, were you actually friends with Sharon on the show? Like, was it all amped up or was there any part of that truth? Um, I mean, towards the end, we did get in arguments. I think it was because, okay, so when we started the whole Party City thing. Because Go you've won nothing. you're only one look that you got. Oh, I have one look? Tired ass showgirl. Fuck yeah, you. Showgirl. At least I am a showgirl, bitch. Go back to Party City where you belong. And, and producers to this day think that they, you know, they want to be, producers want to feel like they knew what they were doing. They were guiding the show. They had no fucking clue. And Sharon and I knew what we were doing. And we knew that if we played this game, we would get to the end. No matter if we were, like, did bad or good or whatever, we were going to make it to the end. They never had a villain, you know, and um, an underdog go at each other like, like Sharon and I did. But towards the end, I think we both wanted to win so bad that the tensions, the tensions at the end were fairly, fairly real. <laughs> yeah. But Sharon and I have always been friends. Right? And we've gotten closer and closer as the years have gone on. And I find it so funny that like when people see us together, they just, they freak out because they're like, they're still stuck, you know, nine, 10 years in the past and think that Sharon and I are not friends. So it's, it's always funny in public when, when they see us together, the reaction. Especially because you guys just did that season four tour and then yeah. you guys were like close then. And I remember like you were putting up pictures and stuff and in people's comments, I was like, this is like old tea, old drama. Like you can become yeah. afterwards. Yeah, it's, it was crazy. If we would go like, Normally, I'm the party animal on the door, and then Sharon is obviously a, loves, and so <laughs> it was always her and I going out together. So when they'd be like, "Oh my God, Beefy, can I have a picture?" and then they turn and be like, "Oh, what?" <laughs> Sharon next to me, they're like, "Wait, hold up, what's going on here?" It would they would freak out, but like 
Sharon and I have been friends for forever since the beginning. You also mentioned on Willem's podcast, well, Willem had asked you about hiding Jiggly's tits during the boat episode. <laughs> Jiggly is a hot mess. Good luck, girl. Oh, shit. What the fuck are my tits? And you <laughs> kind of her. through that, but that was like the most popular question that people were asking. Did Where you... are Jiggly's tits? Yeah, did you <laughs> hide them? No, I didn't hide them. Wait, is that the rumor that I hid Jiggly's tits? Yes, it's everywhere. People just kept asking it over and over. They, they said that <laughs> you hid Jiggly's tits so she would be late. That's the No, whole fuck no. Dude, we were literally in... Wh where did these rumors come from? Maybe because I kicked her off there. Like, you know, Fifi had it in for her. Nah. Um, I never touched her tits. I never wanted to touch anything she had. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know where her tits were to this day. That day, though, she was completely clueless. Like, she had no clue what to do with her boat. She had no clue what to wear. She Just a mess. She was a fucking mess. <laughs> so I, all of us were literally in line looking like assholes with our boats on us while Jiggly's literally running around like a chicken with her head cut off trying to find her tits. <laughs> and I don't think she ever wore them. I don't think... I don't think they ever made, the, made it to the TV screen. They're still missing. Somebody They're still missing. <laughs> <laughs> Someone help find Jiggly's tits. <laughs> so you make it to the finale of season four. Yeah. What was the moment like when you were on the stage? Like, what was that feeling like? And did you go in with, like, a winner's head? Like, did you think that, like, you know what? There is a high possibility that I can win. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I we, we like so to be honest with you, and if people go back and they actually look for the last episode, um, you know there was an untalked every episode, and the very last in season four, the Glamazon video, there was no untucked that they aired, and during untucked, every they were congratulating me, and they were like, "Congratulations, you won, you won," because we thought it was based on you know challenges, mm -hmm. and we thought it was based on who did well in the last challenge. You know what I mean? And so they were like, well, Fifi's the dancer. Fifi got the attention and the critiques up there. Now, when they play it for you on TV, they kind of give everybody, you know, for the sake of editing, they give everybody kind of even, you know, marks. So that way you don't know who's going to win. But on that, they never showed the episode because we were all congratulating. We were all like, yay! <laughs> I was like, I did it, bitch. I beat you. <laughs> uh, wrong. Um, but going into the recording of the finale, we all knew Sharon was going to win. And I think Sharon was, Sharon deserved to win that. And I think Sharon was actually not only good for the brand, but I thought it was really good because growing up in Texas, I had this mentality of what drag was. Seeing Sharon Needles do drag really opened my eyes to like, there's, there's so many styles of this art form. You see yourself on the television. Uh -huh. What was that experience like? Was it everything that you had hoped for? I mean, I had a blast, man. I, I loved it. I thought it was so funny. I still watch clips to this day of season four, and I'm just like, bitch, I'm funny. Like, <laughs> that was such good TV. And, um, but I got so much unnecessary hate for it. Like, people really just, people just get so lost in television that they, uh, that, I don't know. It's just, there's no reality in reality TV. That's, yeah. like, rule number one. <laughs> so... I don't know. I, I had fun watching it. I thought it was cool. Did you, I know that you like fans of course did not take you in the best light for season four. I know that there was like, did they? They did it? <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, new. There, was, there was like a Facebook group to get you out a long time ago. Was it really? I didn't know this. See, I, didn't, I didn't know all of this. <laughs> Wait, I to like get me banned from the show? To get you off the show. It's called Sashay Away. Well, they didn't work. <laughs> so why would they want that, though? To be honest with you, if I wasn't there, that would have been boring, man. Like, that would have, how boring. How many times can we hear Chad say, Cher doesn't say this? You know, like, how many times? <laughs> we needed something exciting. You needed the drama, and you needed a little bit of fuel, and that's what you gave. And I don't know where these new people come from, where they think, like, Drag queens are not dramatic. Like, it's all, you know, rainbows and kisses. No, bitch, we are divas. We have loud mouths. We get in arguments. We, we, you know, that happens. That's part of life. And I just think it's cool that they got to show it on TV. Yeah. I think it's yeah. also interesting because Drag Race is like a reality competition show, just like Survivor or just like Big Brother. And then when you have a villain on those shows, they're a little bit more like, 
people can get behind the villain on them. But when it comes to drag queens, for some odd reason, it's like, you're the villain, so like, fuck you, I hate you. Yeah, I don't understand it. I don't, I, I don't get it. Even like, I mean, I started getting like the most hate when I did the, uh, the presidential debate. <laughs> and I, I can understand why they were getting upset, but at the same time, it was obviously a, like a character. And I think it's so funny because now we're living in that world of that character I created. <laughs> I so in 2012, you get word that your um, cast for All Stars won, but you ended up turning it down for personal reasons. So my question to you is, is if those reasons were not there, would you have rather been an All Stars 1 or All Stars 2? Oh no, All Stars 2, hands down. All Stars 1 was, that was stupid. That was just stupid. Um, and they told us going into All Stars 1 that it was going to be a trial, so there was only gonna be limited episodes. So I'm glad that like I didn't do that. And I would have been pissed if I got stuck with somebody, like either, like they were piggybacking off or like we didn't have stuff to go or like maybe I had to feel like I was piggybacking. You know what I mean? Like I would have felt, it, I think now I like the formula, well, kind of, of All Stars where now we get to show what we have. Exactly. I think like that, that was the bad formula. Like, you know, you can't put two queens together yeah. and then expect them both to like. On any reality show, like Project Runway or, or like, I don't know where they think like that's gonna make, like it's not gonna let, allow anybody to shine. Yeah, no. So then after that whole thing, in March of 2015, you released a video on YouTube and it was called 30 Days in Jail, where yeah. you went in depth about your experience going to jail earlier that year. Uh, yeah. What kind of led you to actually opening up that part of your life? Because I think a lot of times that's something that necessarily I wouldn't want to open up or a lot of people wouldn't want to open up about certain aspects of your life. So what led you to do that? Well, I mean, after being on TV, everybody knew basically everything about me. So it didn't, I, at that point, it was like my, my skin was so thick. Like, I, what do I have to lose? You know what I mean? And the part that bothered me the most after that situation is that there were so many rumors about why I was missing and what, what went on that I was like, that's not even the truth. Like, and so instead of allowing people to continue to um, fabricate whatever story they want to tell to anybody on Reddit, I decided that, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and share my, the truth and, and everything. And they, and it's not hidden. They can look it up. They can see on, you know, like the records, it's public records. So I, I just, I, I had nothing to hide and I had nothing to lose from it. And I know my truth and I handled it. That's good. And you took it under your control. And I think that that's yeah. a lot of times what people don't do. And when things start blowing up and you don't say anything, it's just rumor, yeah. rumor, 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 rumor. Well, I think people are too scared to make a mistake, especially now because of the cancel culture or, you know, it's so stupid. You're allowed to make mistakes. You can say, I'm not saying, I'm not encouraging to do it and I'm not encouraging to say the wrong things, but sometimes that shit happens and that's, that's okay. Learn from it and, and, and don't do it again. Yeah, exactly. And so. what would you say that you learned from that experience that's helped shape you for who you are today? Don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, to be honest, I, yeah, you have responsibilities. And, and for me, it was, I, I ran from those responsibilities and it was stupid, it was childish, it was immature. And I had to learn the hard way how to handle it. But I, I, I yeah, don't, you have responsibilities in life, take care of it. It, it will literally, it's, everything comes back full circle and it will hit you eventually. Good, good point from you. <laughs> Yeah, it will. <laughs> and shortly after that, you're announced in All Stars 2. Yeah. Um, and I noticed a stylistic change from your drag in season four to All Stars 2. So like new team? What? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got money. No, just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> what, what led to kind of like an aesthetic change between those years? You know, because I played the villain on season four, like I said, it was fun and everything, but then people expected to see that every time that like we did a show together or, or it got so boring. And I was just like, I, there's only so many times I can do the same song. There's only so many times I can do, I don't know. It got, it got so boring and redundant and I hated it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do what I did prior to being on Drag Race. I'm going to be this cartoon character and have fun with it. And if people like it, yes. If they don't, I don't fucking care. I'm going to have fun with it. And I think that was the most important part for me maintaining this drag persona on stage is because if I continued to play that villain card for people, I, I would have quit drag a long time ago. Exactly. And then also, like, you changed a big aesthetic. And this was a big thing, too, which I noticed, is that 
people did not like when it was press week and you showed up to like the build series and stuff out of drag. Yeah, yeah. What led you to do that? And why do you think people took such a strong opinion about you not being in drag? I think, I, well, to be completely honest with you, when people watch the show, they feel they own us. They feel that they can tell us what to wear, what to do, what to say, all this bullshit. And that was my way of saying, no, without Jeremy, there would never, ever be a Fifi. And I own everything I create in this world. And you're not going to take that away from me. Um, so I wanted to, I, I love being Jeremy. I, I love it. I fucking hate this shit right now. <laughs> no, but I just see me and I wanted to go myself. See, the, the members of, like, the Cats, which I don't know if anybody went to that premiere, but they didn't show up to the premiere as Cats. You know what I mean? Like, what? so it should be okay to just be yourself. That's a good point. I mean, I think that that's a lot of times what people end up forgetting and people also forget that you guys are human and you guys yeah. are somebody out of drag. Yeah. And I think that that's a big problem with the fan base, especially now. Like, I, like as this keeps growing and the audience keeps expanding, it's just like, I feel like you girls get so much more hate than yeah. years ago. Because, they, because fans, and, and I'm so happy that fans enjoy watching the show and, and you know, and they support everybody, but it gets to the point to where they, a lot of, them feel like they own everything including our creative direction with our characters and and you don't you know what i mean so and i think it's really important that we put our foot down and we stand up for you know what we believe in and i believe in myself yeah and i think that you've done a really good job of showing who you are after the whole thing i think that yeah. that's been good and i think that you're showing who jeremy is like at the end of the day like you had two stints on television and now you're jeremy like, you know, you yeah. have your moment, and then now you can kind of go with it. Yeah, I agree. And I'm glad, I'm really, it actually feels really good. I, I do like my meet and greets or when I'm on stage or anything, and people say Jeremy. I think that's so cool because I don't want to be known and remembered for my character. I want to be known as Jeremy the artist, and Fifi happened to be one of those characters. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's actually a good yeah. way of looking at it. I didn't look at that way before. Like, Fifi's a character of Jeremy, and you can have... Yeah, it's a product. Yeah, like, I want people to be like, you know what, he did 365 Days of Drag, his Harry Potter stuff, he did Fifi O'Hara, you know, stuff like that. That's what I want it to be known as, so. And I think it's, go it's absolutely going in the, right, in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. Now, back to All Stars. There was a fan question that I really, I'm going to read this to you because I could not find any information about this, and I don't know if it's Thanks. just a rumor or... Okay. <clears throat> What was it like being in All Stars 2 with Roxy since you both dated and you had a few? Did you date Roxy Andrews? We never, we never, we never date, like we were never boyfriends. We, <laughs> uh, we, uh, we talked, yes, we definitely did talk, but that was it. There was no, no sexual relations, <laughs> nothing like that happened. So, but when we were there, like, <sighs> They really did try to make that a storyline and like they would see like us going back and forth and everybody there knew what was going, like our past. So they would sit there and be like, oh, is there something going on between you two? And we're like, nah, bitch, I'm just like trying to do my makeup. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're just talking. So, but you know, there, nothing ever happened and we were not, um, we were never boyfriends. The spark never ignited. Never, no, no. You know what it is? Because she, I'm, I'm such a big mouth and she's such a big mouth. Like she has to be in control. I have to be in control. I don't think that would work. Like it just, I don't, maybe it would. Maybe that'd be some great sex. I don't know, <laughs> but it never worked. Now, speaking of Roxy, were you at all disappointed that she ended up getting a redemption arc in uh, All Stars 2 and you did not? No, Roxy's my friend. I did I. I I I was I didn't I was happy to see her succeed. It was so stupid to hear like the audience going off about her and, and, and all this bullshit. But to be there with her, I it was just fun. I had so much fun with Roxy. And especially like the day I got eliminated, I knew I was going home. And um she was so worried that she was going home. And I remember being backstage with her and like we have such good memories. Um of just me being like, girl, I'm going home looking like this. Like, you still look beautiful. And like, and she's like, no, girl, I'm not. And I was like, no, you're going to be fine. And I, just, I really do love Roxy. And I'm happy that people love her, love her in return. That's good. Yeah. Do you, looking back on your experience of All Stars 2, did you think the whole time, did you know at all that you were going to have a villain story arc? Or did you, was there a moment that it clicked with you that like, hey, something is changing? 
Oh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, so the moment I got there, everybody was just like hugs and kisses. And it, you know, that's how TV goes. That's it's, it's what it is. But then getting there and doing, so you have to film and then on the weekends you do your confessionals. And it wasn't until getting into my confessionals and Jacqueline was my story producer at the time. She did not like, a, she did not like a single response that I said. And she kept saying, no, you gotta be truthful. You gotta be truthful. And I was like, what do you mean you gotta be, I'm telling you what I feel. And the moment she kept trying to push me to say what she wanted is when I realized like, oh, you don't, you don't want me to be nice. You don't want me to be who I actually am for you. I get it. And that's when I, we started butting heads on, on there. And um, I, I refused to give her those sound bites that she wanted. I just wouldn't do it. Do you think that that retaliation and kind of like not saying what they wanted led to you getting eliminated? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And you know what? I'm glad I left. I, it was not fun. I, I refuse to put my, I do this thing and I tell this thing and like, I tell this to all my fans and any of my supporters, like you deserve to be in a circle surrounded by people that build you up and make you feel good. And the moment that is like hindered or there's somebody negative in there, you need to remove that. And for me, that was the producers in the show. It, I just felt like shit. I mm -hmm. felt like I was trying to you know, I felt like Donkey Kong, you know, I was just trying to run up the ladders and then the producers of Donkey Kong throwing barrels at me every time. And it just was like exhausting. So I, I'm, I'm happy I left. I am so fucking happy that I did not win. <laughs> <laughs> did you, do you, do you feel the same way that Adora felt when she left early? I think I need to go. I'm leaving RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 2. I feel like shit. I completely get why Adore left. And you know what? And I kind of felt bad because I was the one that held Adore's hand when she left. And I was like, you are not leaving. Like, you're going to stick this through. I told her to, um, like, just sleep it off that night. If you feel bad tomorrow when we film the next episode, then do what you got to do. But at least just think about it and everything. And in that moment, I get it. I fucking get it. <laughs> because it just makes you feel like shit. We, we spent all these years touring and building up our brand and our fan base and this positive circle for us to just go back on TV and get it ripped down to tell us that we're nothing again. You know what I mean? And it's just, it, that's horrible. It's, it's not a good feeling. And I think that no. at, the, at the end of the day too, like you can kind of see that. You can kind of see your, your energy. You can see Adore's energy on there that like there, there was yeah. a turning point. Yeah, it's just, I think that's sad. And I think I, people got mad at Adore. And you know what? Fuck, th those aren't real fans. Those are not real fans of Adore if they got mad at um, if, if If you're a real fan of somebody, you would applaud that person for taking them out of that, that situation that made them feel uncomfortable. Exactly. Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, that's all it comes down to. And then yeah. you, I know that you, you didn't go to the reunion. <laughs> First one, yay! First one. Um, <laughs> Was, was there a reason why you decided not to go? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, they can't use words against me if I'm not there. You know what I mean? And um, I was not going there from a place of love. I was ready to cuss Rue out. I was ready to cuss the producers out. I was ready to just go off on Alyssa. Like, there was so much hate in my heart. Like, I, it wouldn't have gone well. And for me, it was the best thing to do to just not show up. Just... Just don't give them what they want because I can say whatever the fuck I want to say to RuPaul, but it, it, to, to the fans, it will never show as good. It will never, whether RuPaul was right or wrong, it will it never show as anything positive for me. And the, and the producers would never allow that to happen. So I just decided I'm better than this. I don't need to put myself through it. Props to you because I think that you, you took control of the situation. Like you're not going to yeah. be controlled. Like at the end of the day, like you could have gone in there and been the nicest, sweetest person in the world. But if the edit was totally different, then yeah. it's not, it's not going to matter. Yeah. And, and I do want to say like, and I've said this a bazillion times, people are like, oh, she sounds ungrateful. I am beyond grateful for everything that the show has done as far as giving me a, a stage and a voice and a platform now. Um, but for me, how I look at it is the show might have mentioned my name, but I made my name. You know what I mean? The show didn't, didn't leave a great light on me. I had to do that myself. So as I, I'm so grateful that the show was able to mention my name to the world. And now I'm so grateful I can leave them aside and let RuPaul's Drag Race be RuPaul's Drag Race. And now Jeremy can shine and show the world who he really is. I, I think that that is very, very, very admirable because both you, I, when I interviewed Willem, and then when I interviewed Pearl, 
they both said the exact same thing. Like, you know, the show may not have shown me in the best light and I may not have had whatever it was, but it gave me the platform. However, I am who I am. It didn't make me who I am. I am who I am. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where some people are like, no, no, RuPaul fed you. RuPaul never fed me my entire life. When I was homeless, I, I, Jeremy fed Jeremy. You know what I mean? And so I, I, RuPaul allowed my name to be said on TV and I am so grateful for that. I, to this day, I will forever be grateful for that. But um, it is Jeremy who has made Jeremy who he is today. <laughs> Woo! Good yeah. words. Um, <laughs> one last tidbit of RuPaul and then we're moving on from Ru. Um, okay. When the reunion ended up airing, he said, The proudest achievement of my career has been to provide a platform that has launched the careers of 100 queens to international stardom. Now, what you decide to do with that platform is up to you. She then mm-hmm. proceeds to kind of mock you over your opinion on the edit and then made a whole game of bullshit. I blame the edit. I'd say, bullshit. And yeah. then she ended up tweeting a gif of Jessica Rabbit that said, yeah. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. And then yeah. she unfollowed you. And those moments, how did you handle that situation? Because I don't know I mean, if I would have handled it in the best way. I mean, I, I, at, at that point, it was just like, you're a fucking fraud. You're, RuPaul is a fraud. And it was just like, you know, you, you have this show where it says everybody say love, um, that we are a family, and that she loves each one of her, you know, her children. And it's bullshit. I was literally locked in a fucking bathroom crying in London because I was so I was so proud of this episode that I was on because I won and I knew there was a, it was great and then they they twisted it to make it look like it was evil and I broke down. I remember crying at like airports and just I was I remember Jiggly I would call Jiggly all the time and I'd be like I can't handle this. Like this is completely a, a totally different ball game since season 4 now and it's just too much. Like I am not this person. I am the person that fucking throws on charities and goes to Puerto Rico to fucking rebuild roofs myself like that's me and they're making me seem like this villain and it was just it was horrible and so to see a grown-ass established man in Hollywood pick on someone who was at the most vulnerable on TV for ratings and make a bullshit paddle that didn't define who I was that told me exactly who she is and that is someone that's bought out by Hollywood that does not give a shit about any of her contestants unless they're making her money yeah period (laughs) period on period Moving on from the RuPaul now, but that, that is a very, I mean, a very valid opinion. And I think that that has been what a lot of people have seen. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I think, I think from, other thing that was amazing from All Stars 2 is it opened a lot of people's eyes to what's going on and, and how it really happens behind, you know, what happens behind the camera and stuff. And I, I think a lot more people are now sensitive to it and, and can see that. And I think that's, that's really cool. That's good. When you got out of All Stars 2, and you were given the villain at, villain at it again. Did you see any backlash from bookings or backlash from anything like that? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Mm. I still made the coin. People still want to see Fifi, which is cool. So no, I was good. Yeah. Well, after all of All Stars, you ended up having, I believe, this like uptick of things. You ended up getting married in 2017. I did. Yeah. And <laughs> um, you proposed at a Snatch Game show in New York. Is that right? Yeah, we, it was on the Battle of the Seasons tour. Will oh you marry me? What what pushed you to do that? What what led you to that? Um, the insurance. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, it was Michael. I, we were together forever. Morgan McMichael's introduced us at um, in Riverside at VIP. Ooh. Um, but we met there. We fell in love in a hopeless place. <laughs> and yeah, I, I knew we talked about marriage forever. And I remember uh, like I wanted to find the ring and I couldn't find the ring because I was on tour. So we finally found it and I left it in Philadelphia. We had to go back and get it. And then, yeah, I remember being backstage. We, we I literally had no words in my body. I couldn't talk. I was shaking. And I remember Michelle Adore and Miss Fain. I remember them just holding my hands and telling me, like, you can do this. Like, this, the, like you guys are made for each other. You can do this. You ha- you, I know you can. And I don't know if it was just, I don't know what it was. But it was love that just took over me. And, and their words just helped. And I went, not that I proposed. And when I get nervous, I cuss a lot. Like, every other word is fuck, fuck, fuck. So I was like, well, you fucking marry me, basically. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, he said, yeah. Did, did you, when you guys were in the, in the relationship before getting married, and did marriage ever come up and did you decide who was gonna propose to who? Oh, if you, if, it was always gonna be me proposing. <laughs> Um, we, we talked about it many, many, many times. And, and Michael always said that he was like, you know, he's one of those people that are like, he sees all these bullshit proposals on online and these like, you know, trendy videos. And he's like, it better be bigger than that. And I was like, okay, whatever. Fuck it. <laughs> and then, um, so then I, I was like, you know what? He was a perfect, I have a stage for it. Let's do it. And I remember Brazil got a hold of the news before I could even share the news that I was <laughs> fucking Brazil, man. Um, <laughs> They found out I was married before I could even share with my, my following. <laughs> Brazil is crazy. They have the they are, best and craziest fans in the world. They are passionate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very passionate people. And I, and I, and I love, I, I fucking love Brazil. Is, is married life everything you thought it would be so far? You know, we play video games. We fall asleep, we order food. <laughs> That's, that is our life. So we don't, we don't, I, you know, it's, nothing's changed. And I think that's the part of marriage is it shouldn't change. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. There doesn't need to be a night and day. If you love somebody, you love somebody. And you know, what's funny. It's like, we will, like when I'm home, um, cause I'm on the road so much that like, I don't, I, we don't see each other that much. But even when I get back, it's like nothing changed. It's like, okay, what are you, what are we ordering for dinner? And he'll be on the computer playing his games. I'll be on my PlayStation playing mine. Like, and, and that's cool. It works for us. That's great. That's like a yeah. really good relationship. How long have you guys been together? Um, going on 10 years now. Wow. Yeah, so we're doing something right. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Maybe it's because we don't see each other. <laughs> You're like, thank you for this tour right now. <laughs> thank you for this space apart. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, in the whole process after Drag Race and in between two, you started using your platform for some amazing causes. Like you said, you ended up doing like a drag benefit for Hurricane Maria, you ended up doing your Rock the Boat. What kind of made you want to start putting a passion behind actual causes and actual movements to actually end up helping? Um, I've always said that I wanted to do it. I, I've always wanted to do it even before Drag Race. I just didn't, I felt like I didn't have, I don't know, the voice. Like I would, you know, you scream in a, in a full audience and no one's listening. and I'd, and with, with Drag Race, it allowed me to be able to do that and, and use my voice. And even like in my season four Meet the Queens, I always said like, hey, I, wa I, wanna, I wanna help people. So um, the older I get, the, uh, the more I realize I don't really want anything. I don't need to keep buying things or I don't need to keep surrounding myself with materialistic things if I can help other people do it. You know what I mean? Like help them get stuff that they've never had or dreams that they wanna achieve. That's really good. That's like, a, it's a good headspace and I think that when you find that headspace, it makes life change yeah. so much and so drastically. Yeah, and it's crazy because like we are all we're so we're all like so fucking powerful, and it's so cool to see like how much power we have in numbers. When like, for instance, my um, my Queens United just started with the tweet. It was literally a tweet, and then it just it just you know skyrocketed from there. So it's it's crazy, and I, I wish more people would realize how much power they have in their voice, and they should use it. Good, good point. So everybody go use your voice. Is there anything that you're working on now, cause-wise? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still part of uh, Drag Out the Vote, mm -hmm. where we're getting people registered to get to the polls. Um, that's, that, that's the main focus right now. And that, that's a big focus, because I think that it's a lot of underage, like not underage, but um, you know, the age bracket of like 18 to 30 that need to speak their voice, but like we're the most people who do not go and actually vote and they, they they need to show that that their vote matters especially as an american like don't let these people step on us don't let any of our rights be taken away yeah because the amount of time that people spend behind the twitter keyboard complaining about everything is the yeah. time you can actually register to vote to go and exactly. vote spend some time and do it because nothing's going to change unless we do exactly that 100 so um, in all of this, one thing that you have done as Jeremy, when you kind of like broke the Fifi away was you did your 365 days of drag. Mm -hmm. I want to know how in the absolute world you have the time, the capacity, the patience, everything to start that project and actually complete it. Yeah. And well, then was the reception ahead. everything that you thought it was going to be? Oh, the reception was insane. I, 
I, I, I knew people were going to be like, oh, that's cool. Like, like, there's so many cool different looks. And, and I, like, already before then, I was kind of doing, like, some of my cosplay looks. So I, and people would go crazy for those. So I knew that people would really enjoy it. I did not realize the extent of, how, like, how big my 365 uh, days of drag would be perceived. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for it. Um, being, like, um, like, on tour constantly, we don't get to do a lot of, like, we don't have the time in the show to do, like, a full body paint or, you know, any, some of these crazy prosthetics. We don't have time. It's like, what Lycra stretch outfit can you pop on to get ready for the next song in five minutes? And um, so I had this book of all these looks that I wanted to do that I've never done. And so I was like, you know what, babe? I was talking to my, Michael, my husband. I was like, babe, why don't I, like, All Stars is coming out. Why don't it be cool to, like, sync it up with All Stars to where I just put out, like, a new look every day? I was like, let's bring all this book to life. Well, I didn't realize how quickly <laughs> a day comes by. <laughs> and so I remember we shot, like, 14 in a row. And we're like, oh, this this will last us. And it was like, bam, 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 like, quickly. So some days I would have to shoot like like 14 looks in a day. So it was crazy. Yeah, that's insane. And then you ended up taking that over into Harry Potter this past October. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. Like my my straight brother texted me and he was like, oh my gosh, have you seen this? I was like, yeah, I know what it is. Well, um, I love the Harry Potter series because a I wanted if I always said if I did another photo series, I'm never going to do 365 days of drag. I will never do that again. Um, <laughs> But I, if I did a photo series, I need to make sure that it is, it's, it's a step up from the photos I put out in the past. And so I was like, what crazy thing could I do? And, and Harry Potter, I went to the tour and I got the games and everything, was gifts. I was like, all right, let me do this. Let me bring it to, to life. So I did. And um, what I loved about it the most is A, it was Jeremy Carey as whatever the character mm -hmm. wasn't Phoebe. But B, it, like you said, your straight brother, it, I got so many messages from people that were not Drag Race fans. Um, never seen the show, nothing about it, just admired it and brought like families talking about the show and the books and everything and sharing their memories. And um, I just thought it was so cool that it was, I, like I was either in drag or just like a, you know, a short little fat man <laughs> with a beard and, and everybody found a happy part with it. And then you like, it ended up like getting picked up by BBC, Today Show, like you had like a lot of good press that came from it too. What can I say? What can you say? <laughs> Did, I know did how to that feel great? Did you like? Did you get, <laughs> no, it feels good. It feels really good because it's like, if, if I'm not. I'm, there wasn't an article about like, oh, drag race star gets in, you know, a drama with another drag race star. It was like, look at this person's talent that they have, and look how they can transform themselves into any fucking character, basically. So it was. It's really cool to see it worldwide being um, so loved. That's great, and I, I guess another thing that I have a question for is that. What does cosplay fulfill for you that drag as an art form doesn't? And what is the fan bases like compared to each other? Um, the fan bases are pretty similar. I think with any fan base, you're going to have your diehards and everything. But the, I mean, it's, it's pretty much the same. I do find that there are so many, so many. It, 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 the LGBT has a huge um, demographic and like my little nerdum of like my comic cons and everything and my cosplay world. Um, so Finding um, fans from the, um, both uh, realms was not hard to find. But um, for me, cosplay was, there was, I feel like there's more in, an infinite possibility of what I could become. You know what I mean? And there's always something new coming out. And for me, it was a lot more challenging. I can put on makeup and look like a, like a pretty, you know, female presenting person um but to turn yourself into a cyborg that lights up and you know has fire shooting from their you know <laughs> fist or something was a complete challenge that i wanted to accept and, and and go for do you feel like you are achieving that and do you think the more that you go into this cosplay realm the less of the drag persona will happen yeah i do <laughs> um I, uh, and I and I'm loving it um, uh, more. Even if you take a look at like my social media, it's become more and more Jeremy, and I, it's it's what I wanted, and I love it. And I love that Jeremy can be the artist, and I can create you know Fifi things here and there. But um, the more I do this, and the more I tour these comic cons, it's more as me as um, as the instructor is teaching people, and like we'll be doing um, like makeup master classes and sewing master classes and wig master classes. And so I I've. I've gotten to the point in my life now where I just rather share my talents and see how people can um, take those and create magic with them. Would you ever share your talents and do a television show revolving around cosplay and stuff? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh, I, we'll, we'll find out, I guess. Guess we'll find out. Yeah. So, what would you say is the biggest misconception of Jeremy? So that I'm a bitch. <laughs> that would be the biggest one. Um, people can't separate the two, and people are afraid to talk to me. Like some, when we're out in public, they're, they're just like they don't know what to expect. And then when they meet me, the first thing they always say is, "Oh wow, you're you're way nicer than I thought." <laughs> and I'm like, I tried to tell you all for years. <laughs> so yeah. Are you truly happy? I am. I'm happy now. I I. I I, th I think I lied to myself. No, I don't think. I know I lied to myself to tell me I was happy. And I think that was just like a coping mechanism to get over like all the bullshit I went through with Drag Race. And But now I'm happy because I realized like I don't... I, a, first off, my friend circle is so small and I'm so happy for that. <laughs> because the older I get, the more I realize I don't need 5,000 people to say they're my friend when I just have like... I have my husband and my best friend Rachel who's literally sitting next to me. Um, and And those are the only people that you know really matter to me and that's perfect but um it took me a long time to realize that i don't need anybody else to, um around me to um what was it um pr prove my happiness i, I guess because it's hard to say um that as long as i'm happy i don't give a, i don't care what's going on around me <laughs> i think that's the hardest thing that i had to learn for myself too it's like Happiness all comes from within the inside of you, but yeah. literally you have to realize for yourself that you don't need the thousand people around you. Yeah. You look cool or popular or whatever it is. It literally is like, you can have your boyfriend, you can have your best friend and you're dandy. You're good. And you know, what's funny is like, um, I think of course nowadays everything's likes, 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 likes. How many likes can I get? How many views can I get? And, and, and people mistake that for being loved. And that, and that is absolute, absolute false representation of what love is. And when people realize that that means nothing <laughs> um, to what real love is, I, I think they would be doing a service to themselves. Uh, I just love, I, I love every bit of that. I think that a lot of people- need Oh good, well clip it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what is next for Jeremy? Next for Jeremy, well, um, I will be coming out with more music, which I'm excited about. I have my um, comic book that I'm working on. Um, so I'm really excited about that one too. And then a lot of gaming. I, I'm gonna be teaming up with a big makeup company um, soon where I get to mix all my gaming and my cosplay world um, together and we'll be touring a bunch of conventions. So I'm really looking forward to doing that, especially as, as Jeremy. I think that's so, so cool. That's actually pretty cool. Like an yeah. actual like, touring with like that's, what what what's like a design like like have you thought about like what you want to like perceive or doing when you're going to these conventions well so like i said i rather so this upcoming tour that we're going to do from um conventions to convention is um showing people how to transform themselves and i can't i can't say much about who i'm teaming up with yet but um the, the makeup company really cares about their um their their it's not like a, a makeup company that puts out a brand new um palette every freaking week and was like here's some said celebrity on it here buy this palette it's not even like that like this company genuinely cares medically about the person the, the whoever the customer's skin is and how that can change their lives and transform them and that was perfect um i felt relation for me because i transform myself into anybody so if i can bring the artist side into that um i, I think it's gonna be amazing yeah, and I mean, I think too, like if you're like teaching and like showing too, that's yeah. also amazing. That's well, that's how I learned. I learned when I first started drag. I used to sit in the backstage and watch the drag queens do their makeup. And I remember I would go to Walmart and go buy stuff that I thought was similar to it, and I would practice and do my face. And I didn't have anybody to like sit me down and be like, "Hey, this is how you can apply this. Here's how you can do it. Here's what you should use." And so I think teaming up with this makeup company and then touring all these conventions um, is really going to help. And there's nobody doing that at these conventions, so I'm the perfect person. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. Like I, I'm really glad that your life and your trajectory of like you're able to right now go from the Fifi to actually be yourself. I think that that is really yeah. a positive outlook because I would have hated it if you would have been like Fifi and it's, it's done. Like you can't make that transition. But I think that you're doing the transition so well. And yeah. that says a lot about you and a lot about your character as well. Aw, thank you. <laughs> um, so if you had to give a message to the LGBT um, community and your fans, um, what would you say to them if they're struggling to be themselves or come out or they just need a little bit of encouragement? What would you say? 
Well, I mean, first thing I'd want to say to the LGBT community is fucking be nice to each other. Like, what is wrong with y'all that you feel, like we feel this need to bring people down to feel better? Like, that's not what our community is ever supposed to be about. And if we don't stand up and sit there and say, like, hey, like, we love you. We, 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 here's how we can be your blah. Anybody from the outside is not going to feel that way. And they're going to feel that they can treat us like shit. So first off, be nice to each other. <laughs> um, second of all, um, you know, when it's, someone needs to come out of the closet, or they don't need to, sorry. When someone, when someone chooses, this is that they want to come out of the closet. It's on their terms and it should be their terms. And um, I hope that whenever that happens for that person, that they are able to feel that they can count on anybody in the community to be by their side and help them and guide them. So I think that if we were just a little bit kind, kinder to each other with and had um, open arms, I think we would get a lot further as a community and more people would take us seriously. Oh, inspiring. That's, that's really, really good. Like, I think that that... You're, the, the message that you said about LGBT and hatefulness and like the criticism that we're always trying to attack, like it, it just amps up more and more and it just makes for an unwelcoming community. And I feel like that's it does. a big thing. And I think people get, you know, sh throwing shade and reading is, is, is used so much that people mistake it for just being a, a dick. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, if, if people are not laughing, if, if, if I throw a joke at you and you're not laughing, then that was not funny for you. Like, we're not enjoying that. And that's what, that's what shade and reading should be about, um, not bringing someone down. So I think we can joke and have fun with each other, but at the same time, we should, be, we should be lifting each other up at the end of the day. Exactly. And as we're all closing this in together, what are some words of wisdom that you've been told that you live by? Everybody say love. <laughs> <laughs> some people can practice it um like myself you know but um no that is I, I, i'm just kidding obviously but like um that is actually a very very good um words to live by <laughs> it is really good words to live by and i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out to do this i think that i will say fully that when i saw you on season four i was given a wrong interpretation of you um, from what the camera show and then after I followed you on Twitter and everything and I saw who Jeremy really was as a person I think yeah. that that says so much and I have followed you and I think this interview too just for me seeing who you are and how Amazing you are and what you're doing and how you actually have like Jeremy has a heart like you know like and I think and I really do hope that this gives people a look into your life and who you are as a person because I think that you have been misrepresented pretty unfairly well, so thank you of course. <laughs> thank you that was very sweet no it, I, you I, mean, know. I mean it and i really do hope that people can see that well thank you and thank you for having me this is your first uh, virtual it's my first <laughs> virtual i mean while we're all in this i love it so thank you for having me and, and thank you for um letting me share my story of course thank you so much um until next time guys make sure to subscribe jeremy where can everybody find you at where's your instagram your twitter your all of that stuff and are you doing you're doing twitch live streams i am i am doing twitch and which has been absolutely amazing it's been super fun uh, to just stream video games and just talk shit with people so they can find me um all my links are on my instagram um to anything whether it be my twitter to my um, um how they can contact me and my twitch at fifi o'hara on instagram well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. That's all for this episode of Exposed Virtual Edition. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode. Do you like the virtual edition? Who should I have on next? And on top of that, be sure to click the link in my bio and uh, sign up for my Patreon if you want to help support me and support this channel to keep putting out this content with these amazing drag queens. Just click that in the bio. Until next time, I'll see ya. Bye.